Good afternoon, Madam Gentlemen. Today, we commence the second round of this oral pleadings, where the party will present their witnesses, experts, and further arguments concerning the delimitation of the ABA area. This round will continue until 1 p.m. on Wednesday, April 22. In keeping with paragraph 4.21 of procedural order number one, each party has been allotted a maximum of five hours and 45 minutes for this round. Cross-examination by each party of the other party's witnesses shall be deducted from the former's time. 30 minutes of time has been allotted for questions from the tribunal and other contingencies. To maintain the efficiency of this round of pleading, may I request that each party be mindful of the time limitations I have mentioned and manage their presentation and cross-examination times judiciously. One more, Professor Crawford, the floor is yours. Mr. President, members of the Tribunal. As you've said, the next two and a half days is devoted to the second part of your task as defined in Article 2C of the Arbitration Agreement. On the basis and assumption that the ABC experts exceeded their mandate, it is for this tribunal to define, i.e. delimit on map, the boundaries of the area of the nine Nyoktinka chiefdoms transferred to Kordofan in 1905, based on the submissions of the parties. Our presentation in this phase will be organised as follows. I will make some brief preliminary remarks, first on the character of your task under Article 2C, and secondly on the characteristics of the SPLMA's claimed boundaries. I will then ask you, Mr President, to call on our cartographic expert, Mr Alastair MacDonald, who, as agreed, will make a presentation of the mapping issues in his capacity as expert before responding to questions from the opposite party and from the Tribunal. He will be followed by Mr Bundy, who will present argument on the limits of the transferred area as a geographical matter, focusing on the transfer documents and the recorded location of the provincial boundaries at the relevant time. Tomorrow morning, following Mr Bundy, who will probably be still going this evening, we will present our fact witnesses as follows. First, for cross-examination, Mr. Zachariah Artemd and Tibek Singh Clear and Mr. Mushkar B -B Babu Namir. These will be presented at the request of the SPLMA for cross-examination. As we've said, we do not intend to conduct any examination in chief of the witnesses we tendered. We simply leave their witness statements on the record. They will give evidence contrary to earlier indications in Arabic using the Arabic translator. The three other witnesses have a cheer squad. The three other witnesses, Mr. Ayom Mate Ayom, Mr. Majak Matit Ayom, and Mr. Majid Yakkur, will be made available at the request of the tribunal, but have not been selected for cross examination by the SPLMA. Following these witness presentations, I will conclude with a close examination of the documentary and map evidence for the location of the Nyok Dinka in and after 1905. In the course of this, I will discuss various SPLMA arguments seeking to sustain their claim, claim line based on a tribal interpretation of the formula. I turn then to my first preliminary remark. Under Article 2C of the Arbitration Agreement, it becomes your task on the assumption of an excess of mandate to define, i.e. delimit on map, the boundaries of the areas of the nine York Dinka chiefdoms transferred to Kordofan in 1905 based on the submissions of the parties. I stress those words. 
This is not a strict appeal limited to the dossier before the ABC. It is a de novo rehearing leading to a new decision by you in the fulfilment of a mandate which is your own. Both parties recognize this and both have put a great deal uh, of new material before you. New maps, new documents, new witnesses, new expert reports. No doubt you are still entitled to take into account what the ABC experts wrote in their report and because the report and the associated material are part of the dossier before you. But once the report has been set aside for excess of mandate, it has no authority or status other than the intrinsic, state, status that you do, other than the intrinsic merits of the arguments as you see them. From this point on, you have to decide the case for yourself based on the much more extensive dossier before you. Indeed, I say this with some hesitation, I don't think this is in dispute. Furthermore, this is true whatever the ground or grounds on which you find excess of mandate. Article 2, paragraph C of the arbitration agreement makes no distinction in this regard. As soon as the expert's report is held to have been vitiated in any respect as an excess of mandate, then Article 2, paragraph C of the arbitration agreement is triggered and the excess of mandate phase is over and done with. And this is true whether the excess was procedural or substantive uh, or involved matters un infra or ultra petita. That is to say, once you have decided on one ground of excess of mandate, then Article 2C is triggered and the whole case is reopened. In that event, it is with the greatest respect, not your function simply to edit the expert's report. Rather, it is your function to do for yourself what the ABC experts should have done that X hypothesi did not in some respect. At this point, the distinction between appeal and review for excess of mandate, which Professor Pelle took such care to make on Saturday, disappears. Of course, at the excess of mandate stage, you are not a court of appeal. But at the Article 2C stage, you are a de novo decisional tribunal. Once you're acting on, under Article 2C, the expert's report is not more than a mere opinion. At that stage, you have to be satisfied of each issue that is a necessary component of your decision on the transferred area, whatever position the ABC experts may or may not have taken on that point. Of course, we accept this. If on some point you agree with the ABC experts report, you can incorporate what they said in your decision. But the necessary prerequisite for doing so is that you do agree with them. You have to form your own view on the matter based on the submissions of the parties before you. I turn to my second preliminary remark, which concerns the SPLMA's claimed boundaries of the ABA area. I will have more to say about this later this week. Here there are two problems. First problem is a perhaps minor technical problem, but it is indicative. It's to work out what their claim boundaries actually are and why. In their memorial, the SPLMA claimed a northern boundary extending to 32 degrees 15 minutes east, which is 300 kilometers to the east of the ABC experts' turning point. This was a claim to a boundary more or less on the Nile. It was, of course, a typographical error, though it remains unacknowledged. Mr. Bourne is not as good as acknowledging his own faults as he is at acknowledging those of others. But then the SPLMA reply memorial and rejoinder expressed the SPLMA's claim as follows, and I quote, it's on the screen. The current boundary of Kordofan and Bar al-Ghazal to the south, extending to 10 degrees 35 minutes north latitude to the north, and the current boundary of Kordofan and Darfur to the west, extending to 29 degrees 32 minutes sorry, 32 seconds, 15 minutes east. Uh, the minutes and seconds were the wrong way around. It, it should have been 29 degrees, 32 minutes, 15 seconds east. Based on these consecutive typographical errors, it seems fair to describe the SPLMA as cartographically challenged. 
But the cartographic challenge doesn't end here. It's worthwhile tracing their claimed boundary on a map, something the, their pleadings neglect to do, but which we've done in the graphic on the screen. You can see that the claimed area is incomplete. It does not include the section of the Kordofan Upper Nile boundary between the Bar el Ghazal Kordofan Upper Nile tripoint and 29 degrees 32 minutes 15 seconds east. For a final submission in a case of this importance, that's pretty shoddy. The second point is, however, of much greater significance. The SPLMA's claimed boundaries are mostly not tribal boundaries at all. The only exception to the northern boundary, which, which is the northern boundary, which has never even remotely corresponded to any arguable provincial boundary and which purports to be a tribal boundary. I'll return to that northern boundary tomorrow. For the moment, the point to note is that the remaining boundaries of the claimed area are not tribal boundaries at all. They are provincial boundaries, or in one case, a constructed line extending a provincial boundary. Take, for example, the western boundary between Kordofan and Darfur. It was defined, perhaps it's more accurate to say redefined, by Sir Rudolf Slatin, that redoubtable Austrian, in 1903, down to the tripoint with Bar el Ghazal province on the Bar el Arab. Slatin knew his way around. He had been governor of Darfur and was now inspector general of the Sudan, second only to Wingate. He was not confused about the Bar el Arab. The Darfur boundary was modified on several subsequent occasions, most notably pursuant to the Munro Wheatley Agreement of 1924. At no stage in the history of the Darfur boundary, before or after 1905, was there the slightest indication that the Nyok Dinka had any interest or rights as far west as the Darfur boundary, and I'll show you this in more detail tomorrow. Indeed, in their first submission before the ABC, the SPLMA did not even claim a connection with the Darfur boundary. I'll return to the issue of tribal boundaries in more detail tomorrow. The present point is a simple one. The SPLMA claimed area is a mishmash of provincial and alleged straight line tribal boundaries. They adopt a tribal interpretation when it suits them in the north and the top of the east and a territorial interpretation when it suits them in the south and in the west. The Arabia area is a complete hybrid, not based on any coherent interpretation of the formula at all. Mr. President, with that, it would be convenient to call Mr. Alastair MacDonald to, uh, to give evidence. I thank you very much, and I call Mr. Alistair MacDonald. <laughs> Mr. MacDonald, can I ask you to read out the affirmative which is in front of you? I solemnly declare, upon my honor and conscience, that my statement will be in accordance with my sincere belief. Thank you. Mr. President, as I'm not uh, well known in this uh, tribunal, may I just introduce myself before I start? Mr. President, maps have been a passion all my life, and I decided to be a land surveyor at the age of nine. I qualified 54 years ago at the age of 22 and went to work as a bush surveyor in Africa. Over the next 16 years, I worked for significant periods in eight African territories and for short periods in six others, one of which was Sudan. I returned to the UK in 1971 and in 1983 I became a director and for a short time acting director general at Ordnance Survey, the National Mapping Agency. I have sat on the governing council of the Royal Geographical Society. I was president of a working commission of the International Society of Photogrammetry and Remote Sensing. 
and Chairman of the Association of Geographic Information in the UK. I retired in 1992 and, rather to my surprise, became involved in international boundaries. I acted as advocate for Nigeria in the Cameroon-Nigeria case, as an advisor to the Ethiopian legal team in Eritrea versus Ethiopia, and I've done some work for the Palestinian Authority. Uh, with your permission, Mr. President, I will now turn to my presentation. Mr. President, members of the Tribunal, it is a great honour for me, as a land surveyor of rather advanced years, to appear before your distinguished Tribunal in such august surroundings. And my task today is threefold. First, I would like to explain to the Tribunal the development of the depiction of the Bar el Arab on contemporary maps of the period. Secondly, I shall take the Tribunal through some examples of serious misinterpretation of the mapping evidence by the SBLMA to show that the confusion that it claims to exist is largely self-generated. Finally, I would like to show the Tribunal how the error made by Wilkinson in 1902 resulted in a deviation of the Bar el Arab on the 1904 Intelligence Office map rather than a misnaming of the Ragaba es Zaga as a whole, as claimed by the SPLMA. Mr. President, printed copies of all the maps and quotations that I intend to refer to in the course of my speech are contained in sequential order in tabs two to four in the arbitrator's folder. Tab two contains the first 12 items. Tab three contains a printed map which I will not display on screen, but which I will invite you to look at in your folder at the appropriate time. Tab 4 contains the remaining 14 items. Mr. President, I hope that you will find that acceptable. I begin with the depiction of the Bar el Arab. It is one of three rivers which have featured prominently in this case the others being the Ragaba es Zaga and the Lol. It is worth pointing out here that the Lol is sometimes named throughout on early maps as the Borough, the name of one of its headwaters. During the latter part of the 19th century and the early years of the 20th century, there was some uncertainty over the exact courses of the Bar el Arab and Lol. The existence of the Ragaba es Zaga remained unknown to mapmakers during the 19th century and was not acknowledged on the official mapping of Sudan until 1907 and then only in a crude and shortened form. A more detailed and extensive outline of its course appeared in 1909. It has been claimed by the SPLMA that there was so much confusion over which river was which that it was not possible to define a boundary using the Bar el Arab. I believe that in spite of some uncertainty, it was possible to identify this river. In this context, it is useful to establish, first of all, those features that are exhibited by the Bar el Arab, which can be used to distinguish it from other rivers. We can then test early maps against these features to determine how well a particular map depicts them. On your screen now, is a modern map of the area prepared by the government for this case. It is derived from satellite imagery and shows the courses of the three rivers and that of the Bar el Ghazal into which their waters flow. The upper tributaries which form the river have their sources close to the watershed between the Nile and Shari basins. But the first point of reference that I want to emphasize is the ancient copper mine of Hofrat en Nahas now circled, which lies close to one of those tributaries. After the tributaries combine, the main river flows in a large loop to the north as far as 10 degrees 20, and roughly follows that parallel for 80 kilometers. The river then flows in a generally southeast direction through the area with which this case is concerned, receives the lol as a tributary, and finally enters the Bar el Ghazal at a place known as Habat el Arab. This confluence 
is at this readily identifiable point on the gazelle, namely, where it changes direction from flowing due north to northeast. After this northeast section, the river turns to the east and flows on to Lake No. So, in summary, we should look for the following features when assessing maps of the period for the depiction of the Bar el Arab. A tributary passing close to Hofrat and Nahas. A loop to the north as far as 10 degrees 20. From there, a southeast course picking up the lol at approximately 9 degrees 12. A junction with the Bar el Ghazal at the turning point in its channel from north to northeast. Mr. President, before leaving this modern display, I would like to point out to you two other features. Firstly, Lake Ambadi, some 40 kilometers south of the Habat el Arab, at the confluence with the Jur. And secondly, the double channel of the Bar el Ghazal as it approaches Habat el Arab, a feature that I think has been confused with Lake Ambadi by the SPLMA, and I will address this point later. Using these tests, it is possible to analyze the maps of the period and track the development of an understanding of the course of the Bar el Arab. But before I show you some examples, it is necessary to spend some time on the philosophy of my approach compared with that of the SPLMA. I have considered the body of maps that are available to me as forming a continuum which displays a gradually increasing awareness of the detail of the course of the Bar el Arab. To assess the level of increasing awareness, I have looked at how well each depiction fits within the overarching framework that I have just described. I have also taken into account the limitations of the era. For example, I do not concern myself too much with longitude error, as it was simply not possible to determine longitude with any precision in the area at that time. Neither am I concerned by the lack of detail of the meandering of the river in its middle reaches. Until the arrival of aerial photography, it would not have been feasible to depict such intricate detail. For the purposes of boundary making, it would be sufficient to know that the river which formed the boundary between Darfur and Bar el Ghazal and ran down to Habat el Arab was the Bar el Arab it was not necessary to know its every twist and turn. By contrast, the SPLMA has sought to discredit every historical map by comparing it with a modern satellite image and consigning it to the scrap heap, often only on the basis of longitude error, but also through a clear inability to interpret its contents. There has clearly been no understanding of the serious problem that longitude presented before the arrival of the telegraph. And I will deal with this topic in more detail later. Neither has there been any consideration of what might be expected of maps of that era. And on top of that, some comments simply cannot be related to the maps that they apparently refer to. Mr. President, members of the Tribunal, I now return to the development of the depiction of the Bar el Arab. I will start with Ravenstein's map of 1883, an extract of which is now on screen. Taking into account the constraints of the period, we can see that though going no further north than 10 degrees, this map does place the mouth of the Bar el Arab at the Ghazal's change of direction and does take the river north of 10 degrees. However, the Boro, as mentioned earlier, the name is more usually applied to a headwater of the Lol, joins the river too far upstream. But there is no trace of the Ragabaya Zaga to the north of the Bar el Arab.
An extract from Lupton's map of 1884 is now on screen. It meets three of the four criteria which are now highlighted. The one that is lacking is the Lol, coming in as a tributary in the lower reaches. The map shows this river flowing into the Jur and thus joining the Barra Gazal too far south. And again, there is no trace of the Ragaba as Saga. An extract from the general map of the Nile Valley of 1898 is now on screen. It introduces a more convoluted drainage around Chabat el Arab. But the northernmost connection of Bar el Arab and Bar el Ghazal is at the turning point of the latter. The lol is named the Bar el Homa, and whether it joins the Bar el Arab or not depends on which channel might be followed by the river from the point now circled. The loop to the north above 10 degrees and the connection with Hofrat and Nahas are both there. Once again, there is no trace of the Ragaba es Zaga. I now turn to the skeleton map of the Sudan of 1901. It has significant similarities with the 1898 map, as I would expect. The mouth, the loop, and Hofrat and Nahas are all there and are now highlighted. The Lol, again named Bar el Homa, connects with the Bar el Ghazal in much the same way as on the 1898 map. Next, we have Marden's map of 1903. It has been mocked by the SPLMA as the doodlings of a schoolmaster. However, I would like to draw the attention of the tribunal to the prefatory note to his book, a Geography of Egypt and the Anglo-Egyptian Sudan, published in 1906, where Marden writes, The writer is very greatly indebted for information and invaluable help to Lieutenant Colonel Count Glyken, late Director of Intelligence and Sudan Agent War Office, to Captain R.C.R. Owen and Captain Amory, Intelligence Department War Office, to Colonel the Honorable M.G. Talbot, R.E., late Director General of Surveys in the Sudan. This suggests that he had some rather more knowledgeable assistance in his compilation than your average schoolmaster might expect. However that may be, it cannot be denied that the map meets the criteria that have been set for the Bar el Arab. The river's connection with Hofrat in Nahas, the loop to the north, and the junction at Habat el Arab are all there. A river named the Bar el Homa, which looks convincingly like the Lol, avoids joining the Jur and is correctly shown as a tributary of the Bar el Arab. And once again, there is no trace of the Ragaba as Zaga. Mr. President, in summary, there is a continuous and similar pattern of depiction of the Bar el Arab through all these maps up to Marden's map of 1903. This depiction shows that there was a continuous understanding of the important features of the course of the Bar el Arab from the vicinity of Hofrat en Nahas down to Chabat el Arab. By contrast, there is no depiction of the whole length of the Ragaba el Zaga south of 10 degrees north, that is in our area of interest until 1909. In 1904, the intelligence office in Khartoum produced a map at one in four million, which did depart to some extent from this continuous pattern, and this will be dealt with later in my talk. Mr. President, members of the Tribunal, I now want to turn to the manner in which the SPLMA has sought to show that these early maps are unreliable. It compared them with a map of the area taken from satellite imagery, and its comparison is now on screen. The course of the Bar el Arab 
taken from each early map has been overlain on the modern base map by using the latitude and longitude grid as if both early and modern maps were constructed on the same reference system. <coughs> to be fair, the SBLMA did make one perfectly correct additional adjustment when it compared a map drawn on a longitude system based on the Paris Observatory with the modern map, which is based on Greenwich. The result of the comparison, as it appears on map 61, looks rather like a bowl of multicolored spaghetti. The SPLMA suggests that this shows that there was no coherent understanding of the position of the Bar el Arab. However, the issue of comparison is more complicated than it appears to believe. As Dova Sobel says in her best-selling book, Longitude, the zero-degree parallel of latitude, by that, of course, she means the equator, is fixed by the laws of nature, while the zero-degree meridian of longitude shifts like the sands of time. This difference makes the determination of latitude child's play and, to and turns the determination of longitude, especially at sea, and we might also add here and in the, and in the bar, into an adult dilemma, one that has stumped the wisest minds of the world for the better part of human history. Now, the usual method of fixing position in remote areas in 1905 was by observation to the sun and stars, or stars. The problem lay in the determination of the time of the observations. Time can, of course, also be determined by observation to the stars, but it would need an experienced surveyor and advanced instruments to get acceptable results. A much simpler method is to observe the transit of the sun at midday. Some of the officials on trek and many of the early explorers who traveled up the Nile would quite likely have had some means of measuring the altitude of the sun at midday, primarily for latitude for which they would get quite good results. Longitude was a different matter. The reliability of their watches on their long treks would not be good. Just one minute of time error produces a distance error of 27 kilometers in longitude. So until the advent of the telegraph line or of wireless time signals, longitude was bound to be unreliable and a comparison of mapping through latitude and longitude is meaningless. A far better and very normal method of map comparison is to identify reliable common points of detail and then to apply a block shift to one map so that the common points coincide. In this case, the confluence at Habat el Arab provides a useful common point. The next two slides will show the SBLMA comparison and my comparison using block shifts. If we look at three of the earlier maps and then apply a block shift to each of them, the pecked lines show that only a small improvement is achieved in the lower reaches. I've excluded the 1863 map from the SPLMA set as it seems to me to be so seriously in error. However, if we look at the remaining three maps and then apply individual block shifts in the same way, the agreement for the pecked lines against the modern course of the Bar el Arab is really very good indeed. If scale is taken into account, the agreement would look even better as we shall see. For one can also criticize the SPLMA method because it often does not compare like with like. Scale is important in these comparisons. If the map under test is significantly enlarged, the visual impact of the error that it might display is greatly enhanced. The scale of the SPLMA's map 61, as printed in its reply atlas, is just under 1 in 1,100,000, several times larger than the scale of most of the early maps under comparison. Mr. President, 
If I could now invite members of the tribunal to turn to tab three in their folders, you will see an extract from the intelligence map of 1904, printed at the correct scale of one in four million. This is the map. You may well wonder why I have abandoned our marvelous technology at this point. Well, I would like members of the tribunal to appreciate the point I wish to make about visual impact at the actual scale of the map. When using a computer screen, one can never be sure of the scale of the presentation. One only has to look at the three different sizes of screens that we have in the room today to understand this point. Returning to the printed map, I have as an example reduced the size of map 61 so that its scale is one in four million and I've superimposed it on the 1904 map. This is a reduction by a factor of just under four and I think the tribunal will appreciate that the visual impact of the discrepancies is considerably reduced. By presenting its comparison at the larger scale of one in one million one hundred thousand, the SPLMA is, in my view, misleading the reader. <clears throat> Mr. President, I'm sorry for these interruptions. I seem to get a drier mouth than all these experienced lawyers in this room. <laughs> perhaps understandable. Mr. President, members of the tribunal, the SBIMA has shown in a number of instances in its written pleadings a significant lack of experience in map analysis. I would like, now like to show the tribunal some examples. I will start with a quotation from its reply memorial, Appendix B, set against the map to which it refers. Both are now on your screens, and I will read the text. Additional confusion is introduced in the 1898 Stanford map at the junction between the Kir, Bar el Arab, and Bar el Ghazal, with a triangular pattern that appears for the first time and is repeated in later maps. Judging by the 15 minute south discrepancy in the location of the juncture, of the Kia Bar el Arab and Bar el Ghazal, the more northern dotted line in fact appears to be the Ungol Ragaba Es Zaga, where it has its juncture with the Bar el Ghazal. If so, it is erroneously marked as rejoining the Bar el Arab upstream. Moreover, the more southern lol appears again erroneously to reconnect with the Bar el Ghazal south of Lake Ambadi creating a further and mistaken depiction that is repeated in later maps. This additional confusion suggested by the author would seem to be self-induced. The 15 minutes south discrepancy is an exaggeration, although this, the SPLMA do not tell us against what criterion the, discrep the discrepancy is to be measured. On the map in question, the latitude of the confluence is 8 degrees 56 minutes. This is only 9 minutes further south than the latitude of the same point on the modern satellite base map of the SPLMA. <clears throat> Whatever the discrepancy is, it does not justify in any way the claim that the Ragaba es Zaga is shown. The confluence of the Ragaba with the Bar el Ghazal, as we know it today, is about halfway along the northeastern section of the Ghazal. This point is now being shown on your screen. There is no sign of a waterway anywhere near this position. The more northern dotted line to which the SPLMA refers is simply a continuation of the main course of the Bar el Arab to Khabat el Arab. The SPLMA makes no acknowledgement that the southern lol appears to be named Bar el Homa on this map. It is very difficult to understand why the writer thinks that it joins the Bar el Ghazal south of Lake Ambadi. 
when the lake is not shown on the map. I have already pointed out in the first part of my speech that whether it joins the Bar el Arab or not depends on which channel is followed by the river from the point now circled. In summary, none of what is written about this map makes any sense at all. At paragraph... At paragraph 30 of the same appendix, this comment appears. The government memorial relies on a 1901 skeleton map of Sudan from the Intelligence Division of the War Office, which depicts railways, telegraphs, and routes, as expected, given that this is a skeleton map to illustrate railways, telegraphs, and routes. No provincial boundaries are depicted on this map. From the displayed title box of the map in question, we can quite clearly see that this was not a map, quote, to illustrate railways, telegraphs, and routes. These features appear in the title box simply as items in the map legend. It was an all-purpose base map designed to be overprinted with a title and the details of whatever features a government department might want to display. Mr. President, to clarify this, I have supposed that the government might wish, for instance, to issue a map of the post office network. And this is how the legend might then appear. The SPLMA comments that no provincial boundaries are depicted, but the map was presented in the government memorial for its depiction of the Bar el Arab, and not as evidence for or against any provincial boundaries. Further on, in more critical comments on this map, which are now on your screen, the SPLMA states, the river's juncture with the Bar al-Ghazal is much too close to Lake Ambadi. The lol, labeled Bar al Homa, connects correctly with the Bar al-Arab, but incorrectly connects with Lake Ambadi. The connection of the lol Bar al Homa with Lake Ambadi appears to be a consistent error in these maps, often resulting in a circular pattern of rivers at the junction of the Bar al Arab, Lol, and Bar al Ghazal near Lake Ambadi. There has been a complete misinterpretation of the map in respect of Lake Ambadi. If we look at an extract of the actual map in more detail, we can see that Lake No carries traces of a colored infill, which is more obvious than Lake Rudolph, much further to the south. On the second, larger scale extract, the infill for Lake No is no more easily seen. It, sorry, is more easily seen. By contrast, the double channels south of the Bar al Arab confluence can be seen to have no such infill. They are merely the double channels close to Habat el Arab referred to in my opening remarks. One can only assume that the SPLMA has taken these channels to be the outline of Lake Ambadi, a careless and inexperienced interpretation. At paragraph 58 of the appendix, there is another example of confused analysis. The relevant text is now on your screens. The 1913 Cordofan map contains multiple inaccuracies. It labels the Ngol Ragaba Es Saga as the Bar El Homa. The Nyamora Ragaba Umbiaro appears to be depicted, but is described later on along its course as the Bar El Arab. It also appears that the Kia Bar el Arab is erroneously described as the Lol for at least part of its middle course. Turning to the map extract, it is quite a simple depiction. The Ragaba Es Zaga is indeed labeled the Bar el Homa. The map also shows the Bar el Arab coming down from 10 degrees, flowing past Sultan Robs, and joining the Bar el Ghazal at Habat el Arab. The lol joins it below Sultan Robs, but perhaps rather too far north. 
The lol in turn has a tributary which an experienced observer might easily identify as the Anad Gora. No other rivers are shown. It is obvious that the Ragaba Umbiero, which is a tributary of the Bar el Arab coming in on its left bank above Sultan Rob's, is simply not depicted. Nor is the Bar el Arab, erroneously described as the Lol, sorry, nor is the, Kir, the Bar el Arab erroneously described as the Lol. In its memorial atlas, the SBLMA presented this map to show that the 1913 map is inaccurate when compared to modern satellite imagery. This is, of course, true if one is looking for 2009 accuracy in a 1913 map. But the tribunal should be aware that the 1913 map is drawn at a scale of 1 in 2 million and prepared 95 years ago without the benefit of accurate longitude determination. Its depiction of the Bar el Arab is not going to match the modern map produced at a larger scale and based on satellite imagery. Its purpose was to show the whole province of Kordofan, a province the size of France, on a single convenient sheet of paper. While this map may have some inaccuracy in position, it does not contain the sins of omission and misnaming that the SBIM may claim it to see in it. So here again, confusion is being introduced, not so much by the mapping as by the poor analysis of that mapping by the SPLMA. In paragraph 63 of the appendix, there is yet further evidence of an unfamiliarity with the subject. The text is now on screen. The government relies on a 1916 map of Darfur prepared by the geographical section of the War Office. The government fails to mention, however, that this map also shows the boundary between Kordofan and Bar el-Ghazal as running north of the Bar el-Arab until approximately 24 degrees 30 minutes longitude, then swinging south to run beneath the Bar el-Arab and then arch northwest to the Darfur frontier. An extract from the map is now also on screen. And here we have a similar error uh, to the type that uh, Professor Crawford referred to earlier this afternoon. This first error is a gross error in the longitude quoted by the SPLMA. 24 degrees 30 minutes is in the vicinity of Hofrat in Nahas, well outside our area of immediate interest. But even allowing for this, it's very difficult to follow the description of the boundary as running north of the Bar el Arab until approximately 24 degrees 30 minutes longitude, then swinging south to run beneath the Bar el Arab. Sections of four boundaries are shown on the map with conventional symbols. Nuba Mountains White Nile, Nuba Mountains Kordofan, Kordofan Bar el Ghazal, and Kordofan Darfur. What the writer appears to be completely unaware of is the common cartographic convention that the symbols for those boundaries which sit on a topographic feature are often omitted for the sake of clarity. The river boundaries now complete the picture. Nowhere can a boundary be described as running north of the Bar el Arab until approximately 24 degrees 30 minutes longitude or indeed uh, whatever the longitude was really meant to be. So here we have a further case of weak map, weak map analysis. Paragraph 64 of the appendix provides yet another example of misunderstanding. The relevant text and map are now on the screen. The 1918 Nyamel map is likely a misnamed map in the Achwang Sheet 65K series. The approximate provincial boundary depicted in the 1918 Nyamel map is identical to that in the 1916 Achwang map, apparently undoing the variation introduced by the 1916 Darfur map. On a minor point, this sheet is not misnamed. It takes its name from a settlement in the southwest corner of the sheet, as can now be seen in the enlarged extract. 
The boundary depicted on the 1918 map is not, quote, identical to that in the 1916 Atuang map. All three maps are displayed on screen now. On the 1918 map, the boundary has been moved further to the west, reaching the tripoint with Darfur on the Bar el Arab at 26 degrees 43 minutes east. On the 1916 edition of the map, the boundary reaches the tripoint at around 27 degrees 54 minutes. The tripoint on the 1916 Darfur map is also close to 27 degrees 54 minutes. Although care must be taken in comparing the two 1916 maps, the Atuang map is at a scale of one in quarter million and the Darfur map is at the scale of one in three million, the two maps do show roughly the same boundary alignment north of the Amidgora River. So the 1916 Darfur map did not introduce a variation from the 1916 Atuang map. It was the 1918 Yamel map which introduced change. Here again, the SBLMA seems to be incapable of comparing maps accurately. Further confusion of its own making is thus introduced. Mr. President, uh, uh, I'm sure you, the Tribunal will be very pleased we've come to the end of those map uh, examples because I know that uh, lawyers in general uh, are not quite so interested in maps as I am. But uh, there is an important point that comes out of all this. From all these misinterpretations and errors, one can only assume that the SPLMA lacked expert cartographic advice. This might not be important if it was not part of its strategy to suggest that the maps used by the government in this case are unreliable and confusing and thus significantly add to the uncertainty and confusion that the SPLMA claims to surround the definition of the Bar el Arab and the boundary between Kordofan and Bar el Ghazal. In fact, that confusion and uncertainty is entirely of its own making. Mr. President, members of the Tribunal, perhaps the most prominent example of SBMA confusion is the case of the 1904 Intelligence Office map. This was a general map at a small scale covering the whole country. The SPLMA has consistently claimed that Wilkinson's mistaking naming of a section of waterway in the vicinity of Melham as the Bar el Arab means that he and other administrators gave that name to the whole of the Ragaba es Zaga, as we know it today. I believe this to be quite mistaken. The best evidence available to us today on the impact of Wilkinson's mistake is the effect that it had on the mapping of the Bar el Arab on the 1904 map. First, however, I want to establish the extent of Wilkinson's mistake. As the map on your screen now shows, he only followed the Ragaba for two very short sections, about 3% of its whole length. While he did name this part of the river, the Bar el Arab, and the river that flowed past Sultan Rob's village, the Kir, there is no evidence that he believed that he had found a river entirely separate from that which formed the boundary between Darfur and Bar el Ghazal provinces to the northwest, nor that his Bar el Arab flowed into the Bar el Ghazal at some point other than Habat el Arab. The cartographic evidence provided by the 1904 map supports the view that Wilkinson simply thought he had come across a part of the course of the Bar el Arab on its way from Hofrat and Nahas to Habat el Arab. The cartographers at the intelligence office interpreted his report in two ways. The first was to divert the Bar el Arab, which came down from Hofrat and Nahas, around the loop north of 10 degrees, from a point upstream of the modern-day location of Abye, to flow north to Melham. From here, it followed the course of the Ragabez Zaga for about 12 kilometers 
before turning south-southeast to reach the Ghazal at its known mouth at Habat el Arab. It was not a case of misnaming the Ragaba es Saga as the Bar el Arab because they simply, did not, they simply did not know anything about the course of such a river or even its existence. It was simply a case of routing the Bar el Arab to the north and then back to its known mouth at Habat el Arab. This then had a consequential effect on the depiction of the river which flowed past Sultan Rob's village, known locally as the Kia. If it was not the Bar el Arab, there had to be another confluence with the Bar el Ghazal. It was a significant river and it needed a significant headwater to justify its size. So the cartographers had to create a new river with a source in the hills of Darfur Tit to the west, flowing past Sultan Rob's and emptying into the Bar al-Ghazal some way to the south of Habat el-Arab. Much of this proved later to have no foundation in fact. It should be remembered that these changes were carried out on a map at the small scale of one in four million. That is to say, one centimeter represents 40 kilometers. The depiction was very generalized and commensurate with the scale. The direction of travel of the 1904 maps alignment of the Bar el Arab after Melum must have rung alarm bells with those who knew something of its lower course, for its general bearing was much too close to south instead of east. This depiction was soon attacked by Bailden in 1905 and by Comyn in 1905 06. Bailden was convinced that the river coming into Habat el Arab in a general east southeast direction was the one that flowed past Sultan Rob's village, whilst Comyn was adamant that no headwater of the Phantom Kia existed in Darfur Tit. Whilst Lyons, the Director General of the Survey of India in, Cardo, in Cairo, misinterpreted what Bailden was saying, and he was, after all, a long way away. The survey department in Khartoum accepted the two arguments and the 1907 one in a million map reflected that position. The phantom sections of the Kia disappeared and the Bar el Arab reverted to flowing past Sultan Rob's village to Habat el Arab. To the north, the first vestiges of the Ragaba es Zaga finally appeared. Wilkinson's error caused a variation in the course of the Bar el Arab to be shown only on the 1904 map. No other map was affected. His error did not give rise to the idea that the Bar el Arab was a quite different river that did not rise in the vicinity of Hofret in Nahas and did not loop up to the parallel of 10 degrees 20. The mistake was corrected in the 1907 one in a million map and from this point on, the position of the Bar el Arab remained essentially the same on all the subsequent mapping produced by the survey department. The amount of detail of the actual course of the river changed, and the latitude and longitude changed as more accurate measurements could be made. Not every piece of information proved reliable. For instance, the location of Abye and the Bar el Arab in its immediate vicinity moved significantly west on the 1922 edition of the one quarter million series, but was moved back again in 1925. But the general course of the river was well known and there was no confusion with any other river. Mr. President, members of the tribunal, the development of an understanding of the course of the Bar el Arab up to 1905 followed a natural course, a course that could be expected for the era under consideration. The depiction lacked intricate detail and showed errors in position. Mistakes such as Wilkinson's, though none quite so significant, occurred from time to time. But throughout the period leading up to 1905, there was a clear understanding that there was a substantial river rising in the vicinity of Hofrat in Nahas and flowing some 750 kilometers southeastwards 
to join the Bar al Ghazal at a well determined location. I do not find the arguments advanced by the SPLMA that the maps of the period were too inaccurate and confusing to be in any way convincing. By contrast, I have shown that there was a natural progression in the depiction of the river with many common features occurring on one map after another. Now, returning to our opening screen, after having studied the maps that I have displayed, we can see with absolute clarity that the early cartographers got the classical signature of the Bar el Arab right within the limits set by the technology of the time and the scales of the maps produced. Its depiction was fit for, per for the purpose of boundary delimitation at the time. Mr. President, uh, that concludes my presentation. I hope that you have found it helpful. But before I close, I would like just to place on record uh, the very great deal of assistance I've received from Mr. Martin Pratt of the International Boundaries Research Unit at Durham University in this presentation. His name doesn't go on the presentation, but really and truly it should have done. Thank you. Uh, Mr. President, I'm grateful for your advice as to where I go now and <laughs> what happens next. Well, I thank you very much. You can go back to your chair. Right. You can back to this chair and, and we'll now proceed to the cross-examination. Good afternoon, Mr. McDonald. My name is Wendy Miles, and I'm going to ask you a few questions about your evidence. Could we start, please, just a question about your presentation. Going back, do you have your bundle of maps in front of you? Uh, that I don't. But Mr. I'm sure Mr. Martin, Mr. Pratt can put it on screen. And I can see it here. All right. Could you please put on screen the map entitled The Bar al Arab as depicted on maps pre-1905? It's the last map before tab four, divider four. Yeah. Oh, sure. Thank you. The last map before... No. The last map before divider four. I think you, uh, it has the adjustment, the longitudinal adjustment. I'm sorry. Adjustment. I'm sorry, sorry I wasn't it. saying no it. to you. I was saying no to the screen. I've got it. That's correct. You, you spoke in your presentation about adjustment, adjusting the rivers to take into account longitudinal error. Correct. Yes. And you mentioned also latitude, describing it using the quote from the book Longitude. You describe latitude as child's play. Yes. And you said that, and if um, I think I've written it down correctly from the transcript, you said early explorers who traveled up the Nile would quite likely have had some means of measuring the position of the sun at midday, i.e. for latitude. Primarily for latitude, for which they would get quite good results. Is that correct? Yes. So, as I understand longitude, 
To make a longitudinal adjustment on this map, you would need to move the rivers in an est, east, sorry, west-east adjustment. Yes. But it's correct, isn't it, that you have also moved these rivers in a north-south adjustment? That's correct. So you have made a latitudinal adjustment as well as a longitudinal adjustment? That's correct. Okay. Mr. McDonald, I'd like to ask you some questions about your report now, if I may. We know you submitted three. Yes. Sorry, three separate reports. Yes. One in early December and two in February. Yes. This year. Do you have your reports in front of you? I can have them. <laughs> Just one copy. Thank you. Could you please turn to Appendix Two? of your second report. It's the penultimate page in that report. Yes. At yes. Appendix 2, if I may read out, you have said further research in the archives of the Survey Department in Khartoum has shed light on the process by which provincial boundaries were determined, etc. Yeah. Yes? Yes. And in your third report, and you don't need to go to it if you trust me to read the quote correctly, in your third report you say, it is clear from the archives of the survey department that the department must have had rapid access to certain information. It was in, in response to the Belden point. I can take you to it. It's, it's in your third report at page five, paragraph 19. the penultimate sentence in that paragraph. Sorry, the paragraph number? 19 on yep. page 5. Yes? My question is a simple one, Mr. McDonald. Did you personally visit the Sudan Survey Department archive to carry out the research for your reports? I visited the Sudan Survey Department. For the purpose of carrying out re research for your reports? Yes. And how many times did you visit the Survey Department for that purpose? Once. Can you remember when that was? That was on the, if, if I've got my day, it was a Monday to Friday and I suspect it was the 15th to the 20th of January. So it was after your first report, but before yes. your second and third reports. Yes. At the survey department archive, did you consider that you enjoyed free access to the archives? The, the procedure, uh, I sat in a room, I'd asked for any uh, records that might refer to the boundaries of Kordofan and Bar el Ghazal. These uh, records were brought to me, uh, and nothing particularly useful was found as far as Kordofan and Bar el Ghazal go. In fact, nothing was found. Okay. In your second report, you refer to a Conningham root sketch. There's no need to go to it. A Conningham root sketch. sketch which you reproduce at figures one and two of your second yeah. report. Did you see any of the other route sketch maps that are relied on by the government in its submissions in these proceedings? Not during my visit. Did you see the Wilkinson map in particular subsequent to your visit? Did I see the, which Wilkinson map? The 1902 Wilkinson sketch the map. Sketch. Yes. Did I see it during you subsequent to my visit? Yes. Yes. Did you ever ask to see the complete Wilkinson sketch map, route sketch map? I did. I personally did not. Okay. Did you see the Percival route sketch map 
relating to his route from the Kia to Wow. Uh, yes. Excuse me. Okay. Did you see his sketch map for the route from Lake Kalak to Wow? On a point of clarification, are you saying did he subsequent to his visit or did he during his visit? He's already said he didn't see any sketch maps during his visit, so subsequent. Thank you for clarifying. In writing my reports, I only saw the Percival, the Percival sketch maps running south of the Bar el Arab, or Kier, as Percival referred to. Did you ever ask to see the complete Percival sketch map? I very much wanted to see uh, that part of the route between the Ragabaya saga and what we now take to be the Bar el Arab. So did you ever ask to see the complete Percival sketch map? I asked uh, members of uh, our team in England, and I believe that request was conveyed to Ambassador Durdry. But you never did see the complete Percival sketch map? I have since completing my reports, I have seen the Percival, I believe I have seen the Percival complete sketch map, but it is not, I've not used it in my report. The complete Percival sketch map that you believe you have seen, is that in the same form as the first Percival sketch map that you saw that related to the segment of his trek from Wow to Kier? Kier to Wow. Kier to Wow, you're quite right. Is it in the same form? Yes. In what, how is, it, is it produced with the same pen, the same writing, the same format, or is it a rough sketch? I have to say that there are a lot of Percival sketches. I can recall a version of Percival's sketch south of the Kier, which in my view was a fair drawn copy though by whom I don't know. And did you see what would be, in your view, a fair drawn copy of a sketch map by Percival for the section of his trek from Kalak to, uh, Kalak to the Kia? I think I ought to make clear Mr. President, what I mean by a fair drawn copy. Uh, I imagine that Percival on his day-to-day -day journey uh, drew a rough sketch and then uh, perhaps when he got to Wow or perhaps when he stopped for a few days on the route, he would draw up a neater version. That you could say was fair drawn. But when I say that I've seen a fair drawn map uh, running south from the Kier, I'm thinking more, it looked to me to be a more professionally drawn map, and I had the feeling that maybe a cartographer had done that, though I can't uh, in any way prove that. And to turn now to the Kalak maps, I believe that I have seen rough maps of the Kalak to Ragabaya saga, and also a fair, a fair drawn map probably by Percival. So just to be clear, you believe you have seen from the government a fair drawn map for the segment from Kier to Lake Kalak, probably drawn by Percival? No, I have, I'm not saying that. You have not seen. I, uh, you, are con you are confusing me by changing <laughs> direction. I'm sorry. And also changing segments. Uh, I don't want you to get the impression uh, that I've seen anything other than a route from Kalak 
to the vicinity of the Raghava S. Saga. I've, I believe, and I cannot be absolutely sure, but I believe I have seen a rough sketch of that route and a, a fair drawn section of that route by Percival. I have not seen, to my knowledge, certainly not before I wrote my reports, any sketch between the Raghava S. Saga and Burakal uh, close to the Bar el Arab. South of Burakal, I believe I may have seen Percival's sketch. I believe I may have seen a rough sketch. And I have certainly seen a sketch I took to be fair drawn by a cartographer in preparation, presumably, uh, for, for transfer to the next edition of the 1 in 250,000 map. It's a very complicated uh, set of sketches, and I apologize if I'm being a little bit confused, but it's requiring quite an effort of memory to sort it all out without any documents in front of me. No, I think you were very clear. Thank you, Mr. McDonald. Just one question um, about your answer. You said, I have not seen, to my knowledge, certainly not before I wrote the report, um, the sketch between the Ragabarazaga and, and Burakol. Now, have you seen one since you wrote your report, or indeed your reports? I'm sorry, Mr. President, but I really can't answer that question, not because I'm trying to avoid it, but because, quite honestly, I, ha I was not involved with the uh, sketches after writing my report because they were then being used for another purpose, which was not my role in the case. And so while I may have seen them, uh, I have not particularly register them because I had nothing, I had no reason to look at them with care and um, put them in my memory. I hope, I'm, I'm not trying to avoid the question, but really it, it is quite difficult. There were a flood of uh, reports coming in and these really did not concern me in the later stages. We can move on, Mr. McDonald. Also at your second report, Appendix 2, on the last page, the very last page of your second report. Yep. Uh, no, Report 2, Appendix 2, the last page of Appendix 2. The last page of Appendix 2. Of your sixth February report. I need another copy because I'm right, sorry. Right, that's okay. I can pass you my copy. Here you are. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. At Appendix 2, you refer to three sources. This is back at your visit to the yeah. Survey Department archives. You refer to three sources. The Kasala boundary file, the Senar boundary file, and the Funj boundary file. And you speak in Appendix 2 about having reviewed some correspondence. Would you like the other page of Appendix 2? No, I've got the oh, other you've page. Got it now. About having reviewed some correspondence from those files. My question is, um, you did not review any Cordofan boundary file at that time, did you? No. And you did not review any Bar al Ghazal boundary file at that time, did no. you? No. Did you ask for a Cordofan boundary file to review? Yes. Did you ask for a Bar al Ghazal boundary file to review? Yes. Okay. We can move on to the content of your reports now, if, if we may. Could I please have back my pages in case I need? Yes. Thank you. If we start with your most recent third report, you accept there that the area we're concerned about in the era under consideration was a remote part of Africa. And you describe it that way at paragraph 61 of your third report, but you probably don't need to go to it to agree with me that this was a remote part of Africa. I would have thought so. And that indeed there were 
and again, you probably don't need to go to the quote to agree with me, but there were difficulties facing any mapping of that era in Africa. I do agree with that. And also that many of the early administrative officers, and you referred to this in your presentation, many of the early administrative officers carrying out exploration uh, were not experienced surveyors. And you put it this way, at the time, it would have been possible to determine astronomically um, um, this is coordinates, but this would be beyond the expertise of most of the administrative officers concerned. That's true, isn't it? Yes, uh, I have to say that, of course, this is all speculation. Uh, I'm uh, attributing to these officers uh, uh, a level of uh, ability and of course that is um, on the, the best grounds of probability. That's fine. Um, you say that any travel in the country between the Bar al Ghazal and the watershed was difficult. And by the Bar al Ghazal, you mean the Bar al Ghazal River, don't you? Yes, I do. And by the watershed, you're referring to the Lake Chad Nile watershed. Yes, I do. Yes, I did. So I, I the whole area that you talk about when you refer to um, the, the country between the Bar al Ghazal and the watershed is, um, is in fact that whole area to the, without a map it's difficult. Yes. Could, we go to, could we go to your Komen map, which is reproduced at page 182 of your first report? Okay, it's cut off at the side, which makes this a little bit difficult, but I think you'll follow. At the locator inset, we see Lake Chad to the northwest, correct? Yep. And the area enlarged is essentially to the area of the east and southeast of that Lake Chad Nile watershed, yes. therefore. Okay, so that's the area that you're discussing when you're talking about um, where travel was difficult essentially the area on the Komen map? Well, uh, I mean, I'll just make the comment that uh, it's really part of that area because you can see with the uh, lines, for instance, from Meshire El Rek to Wau, Wau to Dumzabir, these are all, if you look at the legend, country traversed and mapped by British officers. It's a fairly dense little network of, of uh, routes there. Um, and it's probably the, the area to the north of the vignetted line that runs through the center of Bar el Ghazal. And the north, the area to the north of the vignetted line, by that you mean the area to well, you, the north perhaps shaded line, of the be, shaded line. So that would encompass the area above the knoll and above the Bar al Arab. Uh, Again, uh, uh, that's a fairly general statement. I think uh, coming down to that place, Shaka, uh, and moving into the watershed area, I think was fairly, a fairly general route followed by traders and slavers. Um, but the area north of the Bar al Arab as depicted on this map? Immediately north of the Bar al Arab, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you, you, you accept that um, the fairly dense network of routes that you describe are not in the area north of the Bar al Arab? Uh, no, but of course, Comen was, was based in the south and he shows the, the ones he knows about. Um, there are clearly other routes uh, coming down from the north that he doesn't show. Okay, and we'll come to those. You recognize in your, uh, sorry, you, you say of this area in your report, in your first report, that by the end of the 19th century, it had not been possible to connect the waters on the watershed, the rivers, excuse me, on the watershed with the known mouths of tributaries on the Bar al Ghazal with any certainty. Can you give me the reference? Yes, certainly. Paragraph 5.1 of your first report. Yes. 
Yeah, okay. uh, that's, uh, well, I wrote it, so obviously I believe it to be true. I'm sure. And you recognize that the task of sorting out the course of the waterways in the area and uh, proved very challenging in what you describe as very difficult, flat country. That's 5.2 of your first report, if you want to check that. Um, yes. And in your third report, you elaborate on the relevance of the problem that you describe as the flatlands of the bar, and you elaborate by saying, the traveler was unable to get any view of the ground to trace the twists and turns of the rivers and the way they were interwoven. Is that correct? Yes. And you agree, moreover, that it is unreasonable to expect a detailed depiction of these river courses until the arrival of aerial photography. Yes, I said that this morning. And this, in, in the Sudan, at least, would not have been until the Second World War. Yes. Okay, in these proceedings, we are fortunate enough to have the benefit of modern satellite imagery of the area. And I think you agree that the actual satellite imagery shows that this is an area where there is a multitude of channels, old and new. Yes. Now, if we could look at the map um, of the 1904 War Office map, please, Mr. McDonald. Um, if it doesn't raise any objection, um, could I ask Mr. McDonald to turn to that map in the Glycan handbook? Mr. McDonald, do you recognize the book I just handed to you? I can assist you. It's, it's the Glycan. Yes. Um, handbook I, to the I Sudan. I haven't seen it in its original edition, I don't think. If you turn to the back, please, Mr. MacDonald, I'd like you to just, if you can, by looking at the reference number, confirm that that is the map that's on the screen. Yes. Yes, it is. And you refer to this map in your first report, describing it as having been produced by the intelligence office in Khartoum in May 1904. Yeah, I, I certainly uh, accept the 1904. I, I, I'd have to take your word for May without looking up the reference. It's paragraph 3.9, but um, you, you, you can check it. I'm happy for you to go to it. First report, paragraph 3.9. find that at page 172. For, uh, first. Yes, that's correct. And you agree, and you've said in your presentation, that this map reflects Wilkinson's assumption that the river he reached just south of Fawal was what he called the Bar al-Arab. Yes. And in your second report at paragraph 10, you say that there was a short-lived period of confusion after Wilkinson's journey in 1902, which resulted in one map being issued with a distortion in the course of the Bar al-Arab to the north of Sultan Rob's village. And I... Yes. And that map you're referring to is the map on the screen and the map that you just found in the back of the yes. handbook. Um, and you say that this confusion had been corrected, to be fair, by 1907. Yes. So Wilkinson's mistake was at least initially accepted by the condominium administration. I only know that uh, Wilkinson's mistake resulted in the uh, depiction on the 1904 map. Okay. Um, if you go to paragraph 3.9 of your uh, first report, Mr. McDonald, 
the third sentence of that report. You say, initially it was accepted by the condominium administration that he, he being Wilkinson, was right in calling this stream the Bar al Arab. Yes, I have written that, and perhaps I should, more, uh, I should have written what I've just said. Okay. Looking at the map, Mr. MacDonald, and you can look at it, it has a close-up on the screen. Uh, can you see Sultan Robs marked on that map? I can. Can you tell me the name on this map, the name of the river that Sultan Robs is located on? It says River Kier or El Gurf. And can you describe for me whether on this map Sultan Robs is depicted on the north or the south of that river? I'd need a greater enlargement for my old eyes, I'm afraid. Uh, the, it may help to look at the map in the back of the book, and we do yes. have a magnifying glass. I'm, I'm not being cheeky. I can't see it either. <laughs> Yeah, it is, yes, it's, it appears here to be on the northern side. Okay, could you fold up that map, but keep open Glycan, uh, the handbook for one moment. Just turn from the back to page 349, please, of that handbook. Do you have it? What you're looking at here is the last page of the bibliography and cartography for the Glycan hand, uh, for the Sudan, 1905 Sudan handbook, right? Yeah. And if we look at C, part C of the uh, cartography, that's entitled maps, obviously. And can you see under the words for general maps, the following are recommended. The first map listed there, would you agree with me that that is the map that you've just refolded in the back of the handbook? Yes, I would. Okay. And could you read out for me, please, the words after the name of that map, the words in parentheses? It says, uh, latest and most up-to-date general map, okay. which of course refers to the Anglo-Egyptian Sudan. Thank you. If, if we could move to a different topic now, please, Mr. MacDonald, uh, the broader subject of what you describe in your first report as intense exploration, 1900 to 1910. You open that section of your report at, para, at page 168 with a quote from 1898, the first year of the condominium, saying that, and, and the, quote, the quote says, these are not your words, Almost a century has passed since Brown mar first marked the Bar al Arab on the map, and our knowledge of it is even now scarcely more definite. No European has explored the course, the whole course of the stream. And you've reproduced that quote in your report. Yes. Now, in that section of your report entitled Intense Exploration, 1900 to 1910, the first pre-1905 explorer that you refer to is Saunders, right? Yes. However, you would accept that Saunders made little contribution to the understanding of the course of the Bar al Arab other than defining its location of its mouth. Yes. The next pre-1905 explorer that you refer to in your intense exploration section is Wilkinson. Yes. And, the th and we've spoken about Wilkinson briefly. The third and final pre-1905 explorer to the region that you discuss in your first report, albeit briefly, is Percival. Uh, I'm just pausing because I'm not sure that it was the final. I, I would have thought I mentioned Common and uh, Bailden. Sorry, Mr. McDonald. Pre pre 1905, I'm cutting your intense exploration oh, section I, down I, the middle. I missed that. Uh, yes, 
I think that's correct. Okay. So other than Percival... Provided you mean by 1905, January 1905. Yes. Other than Percival and Wilkinson, in your section in your first report on intense exploration, you don't discuss any other pre-1905 sketch maps or trek reports from any other explorers in the region? No. So the extent of intense exploration pre-1905 discussed in your first report is limited to Wilkinson and Percival. And Saunders. But you've said that Saunders made a little contribution to the understanding of the course of the Bar al Arab other than defining the location of his mouth. That was a contribution. But you accept he didn't go in... Uh, all right. That's fine. Could we turn to another topic? Uh, knock. Please, I'm sorry. Um, uh, how long? For how long do you think you have to uh, go on? Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Okay. okay. You can go. So keep going. Uh, knock presence, Mr. McDonald. Could we turn, uh, let's turn to the historic and cartographic evidence dealing with the presence of Ngok in and around 1905. Now, apart from passing reference to Wilkinson and others having seen Sultan Rob's village, later his old village and Burakol, you did not discuss the presence of Ngok prior to the 1905 transfer in your first report. No. And also in your second, in your third report, you do not consider Ngoc presence in any detail. And to be fair, that was a responsive report to the response to your first report. Yes. Okay. So then for the questions on your discussion of Ngoc presence, could we turn to your second report? As this is, this is the report that you deal with any of the evidence on this subject. Now, first, at paragraph 23 of your second report, sorry, ah, yes, you deal with paragraph 924 of the SPLMA memorial. And that paragraph of the SPLMA memorial says, and I quote from the SPLMA memorial, Wilkinson next records that at a point 28 miles from the Ngol, he reached what he termed the Kier River or Baraljanga, and, and in quote, the settlements of Sultan Rob, which were located on both sides of the river. Now, your comment about that report was that the citation is not true to its source. Um, do you, you would agree with me, though, that the extracted quote, i.e. settlements of Sultan Rob, comes from verbatim Wilkinson's report? Yes, I do. Okay. And indeed, settlements of Sultan Rob were, at that time, located to the north of the River Kier. That is what Wilkinson said. Mm -hmm. Okay. If we could look at the Wilkinson sketch map. Actually, there's no need. I was going to take you to it, but... Um, I, Let's do it quickly. The, on the Wilkinson sketch map, those um, marked um, settlements, um, the Mareg distance, district is marked north of the Kier. Um, you accept that these are likely settlements of Sultan Rob that Wilkinson came to before he crossed the Kier, if you could point to them. Uh, I think I should make it clear, Mr. President, that my job was to I uh, identify the, the uh, or to chronicle the development of the depiction of the Bar el Arab, I was not particularly concerned with where the Dinka were living. But you did deal with where the Dinka were living in your second report, albeit briefly, at least in relation to this area and in relation to where Sultan Rob was living. I, d I did de deal, yes, I, I dealt with the issue of whether Sultan Rob lived on the north or south bank because I felt that Sultan Rob is a major feature on the maps of the era and I wanted to be quite clear where he was. Okay, and on that subject, at paragraph 25 of your second report, you say that there is no evidence 
that Sultan Rob had moved from his original village in 1903. And by his original village, you mean um, Mithiang, the site where he met Wilkinson. Yes. You do accept, though, that there is evidence that Sultan Rob, in fact, lived in Burakol at least by 1904. I'm not sure, Mr. President, if I'm allowed to say this, but my own personal opinion is that he might well have been operating two villages and moved back and forwards between them. That's how I interpret the various uh, uh, reports on his location during this period. Um, you qualified that as your own personal opinion. Is there any evidence in the record that that was indeed the case? The evidence in the record is the difficulty in reconciling all of these reports without making that assumption. Um, let's look at... Um, you, say, you say in your report that Sultan Rob lived in Mithyang up to his death uh, in 1906, but um, you would accept that the, the evidence in the record um, does not support that conclusion. Can you give me a reference? Sorry, uh, paragraph 39 of your second report, I believe. That's not the right reference, is it? Um, no, it's not the right reference. Nineteen. 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 Thank you. Paragraph nineteen. That's not it. No, that's well, not it. in paragraph nineteen, Mr. President, I, I explain. Uh, that, and again, perhaps this is supposition, but I, that Huntley Watch was reported seeing him on the 8th of March, uh, and uh, uh, I believe that was in his old village. He was, of course, also buried very near to the site of his old village. Okay. In your third report, at paragraph 31, you say that the Paramount Chief's settlement in 1905 was at the site of his old village near present-day Mithiang, and that is about 30 kilometers southeast of the present location of Avier. That's correct, isn't it? Um, sorry. Second report 31. Second. Page 15 of the second report. It's the first sentence. Paragraph, uh, sorry, paragraph. Wh which paragraph are you asking me to look at? Sorry, I was asking you to look at paragraph 31. Just, uh, uh, I've lost the question, I'm sorry. No. I clearly said that Sultan Rob lived at Mityang up to his death in 1906. Okay, that, that, and that was the and question, I so you've that confirmed. On, on the Huntley Walsh. Right, okay, you've confirmed the point, that's fine. Mm. Could we please just, and I'll try and do this very quickly, look at the cartographic record for the location of Sultan, or, or, for the location of the paramount chief of the Ngok Dinka for the period from 1904, at least, to 1925. Now, in your second report, you describe Burakol. Let me ask a first question. Do you accept that Burakol was described um, by Percival as the place where Sultan Rob was living when he met with him? Yes, I do. Okay. 
And in your second report, you describe Buraco as on the west side of the Ragaba Umbiero. Yes, I did. And you say, whereas Abbey Town is on the east side of the Ragaba. That's correct. Okay. Um, so I'd like to look at the cartographic record on that. If we start with Percival's sketch map itself, can you see in the enlargement Buraco? I can. Okay. Is it located in the fork between the Niamora or Umbiero and the River Kia? Yes, in the, in the uh, enlargement on screen, of course, it does say Yamoy, but I accept what you say. You accept that the Yamoy is, is in fact, the Umbiero or the Niamora is a knock name for it. Yes, I do. Okay. And do you see a number of markings suggesting scattered settlements or houses in that area? I see a number of markings. Um, I think it's... Uh, I don't think I can say that they would necessarily mark scattered settlements. Uh, that's, there's no uh, legend to check that. Do you see, it is a sketch map to be fair, do you see Bongo? I, I do, yes. And that's marked close to the river? Yes. Okay. The next map I'd like you to look at, you've referred to it in your presentation, is the 1907 Northern Bar Al Ghazal map. If we zoom in on this map, you see Burakol again marked in the fork between the Nyamora, or the Yamoy it's called again, yes, and I the do. Kia. And do you see written below that, Sultan Rob's new village? Yes. Right. I'd like to take you now to the Whittingham sketch map of 1910. Have you seen this before? We'll zoom in on the area, it might be more helpful. Yes, I've seen it. Okay, do you see Abbey Art at the bottom of the map? I do. And do you see the ferry marked at Abbey Art? Or do you see the word ferry written below Abia? Okay. Would that map suggest to you that the ferry is located as having its crossing over the Niamora or the Umbiero? That map would suggest that there is a ferry uh, three and a half miles upriver from the Kia Junction across the Umbiero. Thank you. The 1914 Gabat al Arab map, if we zoom in here, do you see again the fork between the Niamora and the Kia? I do. And do you see Abia written as an area label across the Niamora? Abia, yes. Yes. And do you see the ferry a little bit above the word Abia? I see a ferry. And that ferry would suggest to you, again, that it crosses the Niamora. It's a, it would suggest it crosses the Umbiero, yes. And if we look at the 1918 Yamo map, which was part of your presentation this morning, can you see Abia again in the zoom in on that map? Yes, I can. And it says in full Abia. A B Y E I bracket salt and quoll close bracket correct? Yes. And you also see an R H just above uh, Abia on that map. Yes. And would you agree with me that that likely represents? I can take you to the key, but can yeah. we agree that that represents Rest House? It does indeed. Okay. So the final map is the 1925. Gabat al Arab map. Do you see that? Yes, I do. And do you see Abia on that map? Yes, I do. And is it again described as Abia, this time Chief Kuala Rope? Yes. Okay. Mr. McDonald, I have one more topic and I will try to be very quick um, with it. It's on the subject of boundaries and I would like well, to take it, you to. It is perhaps a, a good opportunity for breaking. Okay. All right. Uh, should I recall? Uh, Mr. McDonald, that you are not allowed to 
uh, have contact with councils of the government during the break. Uh, Mr. I'd be quite happy to stay here if someone would bring me a drink. <laughs>